Uh, well, uh, hello everyone, uh, in person and online. Um, so it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker for today, Natalia Pavlov. Um, Natalia um, is a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cyprus, um, and she did her PhD uh, at the University of Chicago in the States, where we looked at the morphosyntax of Cypriot, Cypriot Greek. Um, but uh, Natalia also works on um, Sana, the endangered Arabic uh, variety of Northern Cyprus. And that is what we're going to be hearing about today. So thank you very much, Natalia. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, I'm here to talk to you about my research uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cyprus. Um, I, uh, this is research on Sana, uh, the, uh, the name of the language of the Arabic dialect variety that was given uh, to the, uh, the Cyprus Arabic by uh, the speakers themselves. Um, so also known more officially as Cypriot Maronite Arabic. Okay. So uh, I think I'm done. Okay. So here's an outline of my talk. I'm going to start by giving you uh, a brief uh, background uh, for the community and for the SANA uh, language as well. And then I'll talk to you about some uh, experiments that, that I've been doing with respect uh, to uh, vocabulary and morphology to language. Um, and then uh, I will talk about more research on language attitudes in the community and then some concluding remarks uh, about future, future uh, thoughts and future objectives of the group. Okay, so um, so Sana is spoken on the island of Cyprus. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with Cyprus. This is uh, a map of it. Um, it's specifically spoken on a sing at a single village. Uh, the village is called Bornakitis. It's the um, one you can see at the northwestern uh, part of Cyprus. That's also the Cyprus occupied territory, which you can see marked as yellow there. Whereas the, the southern part is um is a public of Cyprus main or mainly Greek city of uh, residency. So uh it's a severely endangered language uh by UNESCO, right? Uh so it's really important for us to document and to study the language and the grammar before um before it becomes a thing, right? So the village is known as uh is Got by uh, all names, all languages spoken in Cyprus, Greek, Cypriot Greek, which is the, the dialect spoken there, um, the, the local variety, Turkish, and Sana, Cypriot Maronite Arabic. So you can see all different uh, names, all the village there. And just some um, pictures of how things look like, um, especially after the war, that I'm going to refer to um, in a few slides. Um, some of the buildings that you can see look abandoned, right? Some more pictures here. Um, it's a very interesting village, a very interesting fieldwork site to work at because, uh, first of all, it's multilingual. You can see that on the road signs, uh, both Turkish, uh, Greek, um, and English are used, right? Uh, which uh, is probably the only village, the only place in Cyprus where you can see all these three languages on the road signs. So, uh, a little bit of history of how the community um, was um, created in Cyprus, right? So Maronites actually date back to the late seventh century uh, when they left uh, Syria and Lebanon, according to uh, the literature. By the early 14th century, their number increased to about 80,000 in 72 villages. So today, Cyprus has a population close to a million. You can imagine back then it was much less people and having 80,000 uh, Maronites, that was a big part of the population, right? Now, with the establishment of the Republic of Cyprus in 1960, Maronites were recognized as a religious group and they are actually today represented by an elected representative. Before 1974, which was an important year for Cyprus because the Turkish invasion uh, happened, uh, which leads to today's uh, current uh, status quo, uh, for Makitis, the village where uh, everything is happening with Dr. Sana was inhabited by about more than a thousand Maronites, bilingual in Cypriot Greek and Arabic. And the number of persons in for Makitis has decreased from 2000 in December of 74 to actually 150 persons today, according to, uh, to work in 2004. Right? I 
can tell you from my own work today, that's even less. Okay. According to the official demographic data of 2011, there were 5,000 Maronites in Cyprus, 75% of them in Nicosia, which is the capital of Cyprus. Uh, and, uh, and it's actually a divided capital, so they were, they were mostly on the south part. 15% were living in Limassol in the south part, 5% in Larnaca, and the other 5% in different villages, amongst them uh, being Kormakitis, uh, where we found them, we find them today. So Cyprus Maronite Arabic or Cyprus Arabic, Kormakitis Arabic, you can find all sorts of um, names within the literature. Um, refers to, uh, to an Arabic dialect, it mainly contains Arabic words. Um, and according to the literature, it's not easily understood by speakers of modern Arabic, right? And that's because of the linguistic isolation, the geographic isolation of the community from the rest of the Arabic world. The words that you, uh, you may see are either, have either partially changed or retained their think attic form, their old form, okay? It's classified, it's discussed as a peripheral Arabic vernacular. And speakers, as I said before, are bilingual in both Cypriot Arabic and Cypriot Greek. Words uh, of Arabic origin retain the Arabic morphology and Cypriot Greek words show Greek morphology with some exceptions. And as we will see today, there's also mixing between Arabic and Greek in uh, certain cases, okay? Just if you want to have some kind of metric out of 630 words, according to Newton's uh, and all their, all their work, 38% is big. Okay. Just to give you an idea, uh, this is uh, some of the um, some of the data that I have. It's uh, from a narrative from one of the speakers describing how to make uh, the traditional food, one of the traditional food uh, in the, at the village, which is uh, pasta, pasta uh, of the hand, as they call it. And what we can see there uh, in IPA transcribed right at the upper part of the slide uh, contains both Arabic but also in blue Greek words. Okay, so you, uh, the speakers, uh, when they speak within the sentence, intersententially, intersententially, within the word, they switch from Arabic to Greek quite often. Okay, and that's uh, just having their translation provided there. Okay. So today, use of the Kormakitis Arabic is restricted to the home where the range of language registers employed is understandably also fairly narrow. Its speakers' sudden uprooting from their traditionally rural habitat and their resettlement in a modern urban context, having confronted them with a host of novel life situations in which Cypriot Greek is undoubtedly a more serviceable linguistic medium, right? So describing the situation um, as it happened um, with the resettlement of the uh, of the village uh, habitants uh, to different parts of Cyprus. So in 2007, the government of Cyprus recognized Cypriot Maronite Arabic, Sana, as a minority language, protected as a regional language by the Council of Europe. Since then, um, there has been effort in Cyprus, funded by the Cyprus Ministry of Education and Culture, to document and especially to revitalize the language uh, by teaching it uh, in different uh, classes, right? So, such examples are um, afternoon classes offered by the Cyprus Ministry of Education and classes offered by the primary uh, school IES Madams. Okay, so within this context, um, another important piece of information is that um, we have uh, this table here that you can see um, analyzing the, the level of competence that people have in SANA. And as you can see here, uh, the numbers of very good, of, of excellent speakers decrease as you go to younger speakers, right? And uh, and that's of course very interesting uh, linguistically speaking, and also a motivation for the project that uh, that I'm doing here. Uh, so this is the goal project, uh, principal investigator Nantes Roman, language acquisition in minority context, incomplete linguistic competence and theoretical modeling in heritage speakers and vernacular varieties. Uh, Dr. Rosalina Fabio is also involved in this research, and uh, this is research funded by the University of Cyprus. So within this project, the purpose is to um, identify whether we have different groups of speakers within the SANA community, where we can identify some of the speakers, possibly the younger speakers, 
as the heritage speakers, right? So what do we mean uh, when we talk about heritage speakers? Uh, well, as you can see in the first quote there, um, uh, a first um, uh, definition of it would be in the context of immigration, right? So second generation immigrants, the children of first generation immigrants living in a bilingual environment from an early age. Uh, this is not the only context where we talk about heritage speakers. We also talk about heritage speakers in minority contexts, such as the one that we have here. So when we have a language spoken uh, by the wider speech community in the host country, Cyprus in this case, um, which has a more official status, Greek, right? Um, then uh, the minority language, Sana in this case, is going to be the heritage language. We have other keywords such as dominance here, right? When uh, people talk about heritage speakers, uh, bilingual speakers, in time, sequential, race in homes where language other than the dominant language of the community is spoken, right? And uh, again, another quote there, um, right? A language that is readily available to children, but it's not the dominant language, it's gonna be heritage language, right? So uh, what we get from this is that a heritage speaker acquires the heritage language naturalistically, right? Through uh, the natural process of language acquisition. And given all the above, the study of heritage languages then should target to compare the grammar that heritage language speakers develop in this acquisition process and the grammar that uh, they should have acquired, right? So we're talking about comparing different groups of people here. So heritage language speakers then uh, are, are adults exposed to language uh, from uh, birth, who nevertheless appear to deviate from the expected native black mastery. So we're, we expect to see differences here, expect to see deviations from the grammar of uh, the group that we want to identify as heritage speakers to the grammar, grammar of the group that, um, that we take to be the most competent speakers of that community. So within uh, that context, uh, work by Polinsky uh, defining um, the group that, um, that, that she calls the baseline language group, right? Uh, baseline language group can be third generation immigrants in their respective communities. In the case that you're actually studying an immigration context, right? But in the case of Sana, that's not the case. Obviously, we're talking about an endangered minority language. It does not have a geographically separate homeland as people don't even know um, the exact location where they come from, just for popular etymologies and things like that, of, uh, of the place um, they live and the place they came from. But uh, essentially, they are what uh, police also calls immigrants in their own country. So doing research in, and applying this method essentially means that you need to construct who is going to be the baseline group and who's going to be the heritage language group. Okay. And of course, we're looking for things like different structural reorganization when you compare the grammars of these groups, uh, transfer effects, attrition, and so on. Okay, so we started this project with the hypothesis that, uh, now hypothesis would be, of course, that all SANA speakers share the same level of competence independently of their place of residence. Uh, and what we aim to show is that speakers who move south and were exposed to secret Greek as their dominant language, do not share the same competence with the Sana speakers, who mostly now live in Kormakitis. They're taken to be the baseline group, and they're taken to be the most competent group of the community, right? Um, okay, so the speaker recruitment, the first phase of the project involved um, actually doing good work uh, with the speakers. Um, the speakers that I worked with were um, around 65 years old or older, and they participated in the dissertation sessions, me asking a lot of questions of how do you say X and how do you say Y, uh, as well as giving narratives describing in Sana um, uh, different stories of the past, right? And their input, their grammar, their language was taken for the purposes of this project to be the baseline grammar, right? So the most competent version of what we call uh, Sana today. Uh, speaker interaction was allowed. Oftentimes, speakers would act, would actually correct each other over which is gonna be uh, which would be the most correct way of uh, saying uh, a particular phrase or word. 
There were even language history questionnaire to see exactly what they think their languages are, right? That's an important question, what you perceive your language to be. Um, and uh, of course, they all said Sana, although they're also uh, competent in, um, in Greek, right? Um, and let's then move on to the first experiment, okay? So after all this work, after the incitation happened, uh, after um, we documented different aspects of the grammar, uh, to uh, answer the question that was raised by the project, we had to um, design experiments and see uh, whether younger speakers or speakers that perhaps are not so exposed to the language, so exposed to the community, would actually uh, speak Arabic in the same uh, way Cyprus Arabic in the same way as the older speakers. So the first experiment concerns uh, pluralization, right? So as you uh, know, plural nouns in Arabic varieties are derived uh, by attaching a plural morpheme to the stem concatenatively, concatenatively, or by possibly mapping a rhythm to plural template of synclatic morphology non-concatenatively. Okay. So in in uh, Cypriot Maronite Arabic, a longer word. I've documented uh, the way you pluralize a noun, right? So you have uh, in the first table the, um, the sound plural, as it's known in, in the traditional Arabic uh, literature. And in the second table, you have what is known as a broken plural, right? So you can see essentially uh, the difference of uh, the suffix being added in the first case in the first uh, table to pluralize noun. Whereas in the second table, you can see a complete change of the word. Let's say in, in, if we want to borrow other uh, terms of morphology, more like a citation, right? Case. Okay. Now, more interestingly, and given the whole context of Greek and Arabic con uh, contact, we have code mixing happening when you try to diminutivize uh, the noun, right? So when we want to say little mouse or little mouse, what happens with this figure is that we have to use the Arabic root and then the Greek morphology. So they use the Greek diminutive and the Greek um, uh, suffix for, uh, for for number, for singular or plural. Right? So you get hankui or hankutia, essentially leading up to getting uh, this number of suffixes that you see um, here. And what's even more interesting is that there's actually grammatical restrictions about it. It's not just about you know switching from Arabic to Greek and, and having fun with the language. It's actually following uh, strict rules of grammar, right? So uh, here, what you can see is that once you uh, switch to Greek, you have to stick to Greek. You cannot uh, switch to Greek here and then go back to using Arabic uh, uh, suffixes, Arabic um, morphology. And here, what you see is that when you want to uh, produce a singular uh, noun that you can't, you want know, to say doing, uh, if you want to say little hands, plural, you cannot use the Greek plural morphology but keep the singular Arabic root, right? You have to actually use both the plural Arabic root and the plural Greek morphology sounds, right? So that's interesting. And then uh, more examples here. Again, if you want to say little boy, you say sahui, Arabic uh, singular uh, root, uh, singular suffix in Greek, right? You cannot do, uh, if you want to say it in voice, again, you have to use the broken plural, the Arabic root, uh, plus the Greek plural Arabic suffix. Okay, so there seems to be an agreement between the two languages. When you go singular uh, and or plural, you have to do that in both cases, right? So the research question that, uh, uh, that the project is addressing with respect to this phenomenon then, is do younger Cypriot Maronite Arabic speakers know the correct plural form, right? First of all, so do they know the difference between sounds and uh, broken plurals? And do they actually know when how to use the diminutive form in the way that we've seen here, okay? So the questionnaire was about that. Uh, we tested 14 participants. Um, they, these were uh, people attending uh, the SANA camp, it's a revitalization camp that happens once a year uh, in Konahitis. Uh, it's a great effort to get younger people to learn the language, right? 
So they were given questionnaires by me. I was present uh, in the class with them. And the questionnaire obviously included items that had to do with the sound and broken plurals, but as well, um, yeah, as well as an additional category, which was, which included controversial forms that speakers couldn't agree on. So one thing about working with the endangered minority language that I can definitely uh, tell you about is that often uh, speakers don't agree between them about the correct form, right? So as a researcher, you have to include um, all possible options. Pillars were also uh, nouns in singular form. They were taken from a textbook that's part of this revitalization effort uh, by the Cyprus um, uh, uh, Ministry. And uh, they were asked to fill it out. So these were the items. As you can see, you have the options to give uh, uh, forms of both singular and plural, broken and sound plurals were included. Right. So um, if you are competent in SANA, uh, you know that the GUI, which is not the Tenusca in plural, if you don't know how to pluralize uh, the form, then you may make a mistake and say Tenusca, which would be wrong. Okay. So it was testing both the knowledge of plurals and diminutives. Okay. It looked a little bit like this, as these speakers again are um, bilingual, right? Um, they were given the Greek word. For the noun, um, which uh, which then had to correspond to the correct translation, so they had to choose which is the correct form, and this is what we found. Okay, so um, we have here the non substantive so the sound, the broken plurals, and then the additional category. As you can see, they're not very good with plurals, right? They don't know how to do plurals, plurals, and diminutives together, right? But broken plurals are even harder for them. Okay. And this is participants uh, under 30. Again, the same, uh, more or less the same results. Okay. So it cannot only be a matter of pluralization or diminutivization. We have both. Uh, plural diminutives in code mixing environments are problematic in a sense it's a vulnerable aspect of grammar for um, what we're in called here heritage language grammar for uh, some speakers. Um, and an interesting example here is what you see in red, right? Uh, this is the, the, the forms, these are the forms for jurors, little jurors essentially, right? Uh, it can either be from that or you can do a certain entry variation in some way. And what you see is that um, the subjective plural form of Nakutia shows a lower performance from the non subjective community of Hinduists. In a sense, confirming again that the broken plurals are harder um, and more problematic when uh, learning uh, this language as a heritage speaker with less exposure, right? Okay, so what we gather from the literature is that this is not unexpected. Uh, so it is, this is work from Albrini and Ben Mamun, 2014. Again, here, um, what we see is that L2 and heritage speakers were more accurate in defining the sound plural morphology than in realizing broken plural morphology, right? So you can see the numbers there in the broken uh, column, uh, broken uh, plural column. You can see that the numbers are much lower than the sound plurals, right? So this is not an unexpected finding. Okay, so moving on to the second experiment, this involved uh, possessive contractions. So again, uh, as you may know, uh, the way to do uh, possessives in, in Arabic and, and uh, Cyprus Arabic as well is uh, some of the ways <laughs> is to uh, employ pronominal suffixes uh, or possessive particles, right? So uh, in the first case, you have a constituent in which the head noun is modified by pronominal suffix for nouns belonging to the lex lexical class of the inner levels, body parts, degrees, of kinship, and so on, right? So you have something like only my mother, right? That should sound familiar to most of you. And you also have another type of construction that involves uh, using the head noun plus the gender particles as the modifier, where the modifier can be filled by a noun or a phenomenal suffix uh, attached to the genitive um, particle. So you have something like Het tel uh, the wall of the house, where tel is the genitive marker there. Okay. And tel is used for uh, masculine, right? Uh, shy for uh, feminine, and shy for plural. 
right? And uh, so you can have uh, Paiteli and Hakle uh, Shaitu. Okay. So tell also functions as a free morph in this language. Uh, it's followed by uh, when it's followed by a nominal uh, modifier with no inflectional uh, marking. Uh, it should sound phonologically similar to uh, other Arabic dialects that we see uh, listed here. Right? And again, there is a question with respect to this phenomenon: is can youngers, uh, secret minor Arabic speakers, differentiate between the different possessive constructions? Another questionnaire was designed. There were two conditions: uh, the phenomenon of suffix uh, plus the other constructions that, construction that we've seen. Uh, nominals were used again as fillers. A total of 48 items uh, was presented, and participants filled out the questionnaire at my presence. Uh, and it looked again a little bit like this, like following the, the previous uh, questionnaire that we've seen. We had a column with a Greek translation, and then we have to choose uh, the correct Arabic form of that, or uh, to say, I don't know, that's an option as well. And uh, here things are a little bit better compared to the plural uh, results. Uh, you can see here uh, the genitive particle had an accuracy of 80%, so they were uh, uh, able to find the correct form uh, 80%, uh, and the pronominal suffix 93%. Okay, and this is how the results change with younger speakers. So uh, from uh, these two small experiments, essentially what we gather is that broken plurals are problematic for younger speakers, while in possessive constructions, the pronominal suffix is less problematic than the use of them. So in both cases, there is some vulnerability in terms of, of the grammar phenomenon that's involved, right? So if, um, if anything, we can identify this as a, as a possible criterion, as a possible diagnostic, of uh, claiming that these speakers are not as proficient, as competent, or uh, claim that they're heritage speakers on the basis of this evidence. Okay, so in our investigation of knowledge of Sana vocabulary and morphology, we have seen um, this kind of evidence, again, taken um, uh, specifically for this uh, uh, group of heritage speakers. And then uh, a follow-up question uh, that takes us to uh, a different aspect of the work that we've been doing in Cyprus. Other than baseline and heritage speakers as possible groups in this community, do we need any other categories? Okay, and uh, that takes me to work uh, that we've been doing with uh, Costandina, Dr. Costandina Fortil and Professor uh, Cleantes Roma that you can see there. Uh, a sociolinguistic study on motivation and ideologies and attitudes or in the Cypriot Maronite Arabic community. So in this project, we've tried to uh, see whether uh, a term that has been used in the literature, uh, in sociolinguistic literature, uh, the term of new speakers can be applied in this community. And the new speaker label, for those of you who are not familiar to the term, refers to people with little to no home or community exposure to minority language, who are given the opportunity to acquire the language through participation in educational programs and revitalization projects as adult language learners. Okay, so in other words, they relearn their community language after language shift occurred in the community by taking classes so through form, uh, formal training. So for, uh, for this uh, research, what we did was to create another questionnaire, um, this time an attitudes questionnaire. And we adapted uh, work by Giongi uh, 2005, which examines the following motivational variables, instrumental orientation, learning the language for practical gain, integrative orientation, learning the language to interact with members of the same group, expectancy, uh, the belief that they will do well in the class, um, heritage language orientation, connection with the language as part of the cultural heritage that they have, emotions, effect, learner identity, whether they believe they're members of the Maronite community, and interest more generally in learning uh, new languages. So the questionnaire looked a little bit like this, right? So you can see Sana is important to me because that is uh, part of my culture. Sana is part of my identity. Um, I like to speak Sana when I go to my village. I consider myself a Maronite. Learning new languages is important. Learning new languages uh, helps you become acquainted with other cultures. It's important in my career. Um, it will improve my finances. 
uh, it will be easy to learn it, I will do well, I feel comfortable, or I feel ashamed of speaking some. Okay, so attitudes towards uh, the use of the map. Again, the procedure involved uh, a questionnaire. This time, uh, this was administered uh, through uh, Google Forms. It was first piloted with some of the members of the community to see, since we're not, uh, as a researcher, I'm not a member of the community, although I interact often with the community, uh, whether these were um, accurate, they could be accurate statements that could be involved, right, in the uh, research. It was distributed to the community via two channels, uh, the friend of the friend approach, Facebook posts, and pairways correlation coefficients in a correlation matrix showed weak correlation between the items in each factor, except a strong positive correlation in some of the factors uh, integrity and interest in foreign language, okay? So this uh, research involved 90 participants, um, which were divided in three age groups. Most participants uh, currently reside in Nicosia in the capital, while only a small percentage of them uh, live in Romania. Just over 80% of participants claim to have close and frequent contact with the Maronan community, right? So here you can see uh, the numbers. Uh, so different three age groups, uh, three, right? 28%, uh, for example, were between the ages of 18 to 35, uh, right? From different uh, places, Nicosia, Kormakitis, other areas uh, besides Kormakitis, including the Northern Territory of Cyprus. Um, intensity of contact with Maronite community, frequency of visiting Kormakitis, right? Okay, so these are the results. Essentially what we found uh, is that the learner identity Right, so whether they believe they're members of the Maronite community or not, actually has the highest score as a motivational factor to learn the language. Right, so you can see that in the chart over there, where the instrumental factor, which was uh, to what extent can we actually use secret Arabic Tana um, for for career purposes, for um, for financial gain, and so on, um, was uh, the least preferred. Right. Expectancy in this case did not show a clear attitude. And here you can see the results for the different age groups. Again, um, showing that the learner identity is uh, the strongest motivation. Uh, some uh, we did statistical analysis on the results. Uh, Crucial Wallis age test was employed for identifying differences between the responses of the three age groups of SANA speakers. Uh, the median response uh, depicting the average values of each questionnaire item in each age group was the same for the three age groups. So essentially, we didn't find a difference uh, for these results between the three age groups, okay? Uh, so we cannot reject in this case an null hypothesis, uh, but, but probably because we uh, needed a longer questionnaire with a larger number of items per factor or with speakers under 18 possibly changing their results. We've also tried this questionnaire uh, in person. So we uh, collected data, uh, not only through the internet, not only through Google Forms, but also uh, visiting the community where again, we had uh, 14 uh, uh, members of the community filling out the questionnaire. They don't, they don't have to be speakers of SANA, right? For this uh, questionnaire. Uh, 10 teenagers uh, were also included. And what we observe here is that there are some differences with respect to these two um, attitudes, to these two motivations. Um, and there's uh, the same um, learner identity motivation that we've seen uh, in the online uh, collection of data, okay? So we followed up with this research. Um, this is ongoing work. We do interviews with new speakers, with, with who we call a uh, new speaker, right? Um, these are active students that are taking classes in uh, Cyprus, Secret Maronite Arabic in Sana. Uh, again, these are offered as afternoon classes and uh, for uh, students are offered in uh, Nigel's Marana School. Uh, they highlight the difficulties that they have with the use of SANA, such as the lack of domains. So uh, there's no practical use of the language, um, right? Uh, but uh, one of them said that is, he's very, she's very interested in the culture and feels like an ambassador for the community, which uh, strikes, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting way of putting it. 
both mentioned that generally others uh, seem to be positive to them towards learning SANA as a minority language, as an endangered language, and that native speakers uh, might sometimes tease them for their use of language. Okay, so uh, for this project, then what we found is that uh, SANA is considered to be part of the identity, part of the culture, part of the heritage of, uh, of this community. It's an important language in the repertoire. Therefore, there's a positive attitude towards it, right? towards learning it, towards using it, uh, but it's not important for any career prospects or anything like that, okay? Because of the lack of domains uh, and because of uh, mainly being used in the home domain, so within your, with your family. Okay, and uh, this is uh, a picture. Uh, this is a colleague of mine, Dr. Peter Sarmosi, who also works with the community. Uh, and uh, here he's uh, teaching some of the younger members of the community uh, the language as part of the revitalization process. And uh, just to conclude, I think I should be right on time. Uh, so the from the questionnaires that we're looking at the grammar of the uh, of the speakers in this community, essentially what we see is that there's heterogeneity, right? The, the group is not homogeneous in terms of uh, having the same grammar or the same competence in the grammar. Uh, and there is need, uh, I believe, and I think there's evidence for it, uh, that we need to look at different groups within the community, positively defined by age differences, uh, but also like exposure, um, input, intake uh, of the language, and so on. So heritage languages are interesting. Um, to study, right, because of different aspects that relate to bilingualism and multilingualism, but also because we see things like these vulnerable aspects of grammar, right? What we see is that in this case, uh, this two uh, small uh, phenomena that we saw, there's much more out there, right? Uh, they're vulnerable in terms of acquiring them, right? So people are not so good at them, they're, they're more problematic. So there's uh, interesting theoretical questions to ask but why that should be the case, okay? Uh, variation, language change, and language contact are, are also issues that arise uh, in this case. So I'll leave you with this quote um, from uh, Masha Spolinski's paper that's gonna uh, appear. Heritage languages are no less complex than the corresponding baselines. They may differ from the latter because of the rearrangement of certain features and modification of operations. But such changes are all within the realm of natural language design. Okay, so special thanks, of course, to the members of the Secret Maronite community, uh, the SANA speakers that I work with, uh, and everyone else who has contributed, my colleagues and co authors, and of course, the University of Cyprus for funding this uh, research. And this is, uh, this is a t shirt that has been given uh, as, uh, as a gift in one of the um, SANA camps the past few years. I have one at home, so as you can see, it says, because with each language that dies, dies a picture of human. So I'll leave you with that, positive. Some selected references, thank you. Thank you. Happy to take any questions here or um, in the chat. I don't know if I should um, open the yeah. chat. Yes. Okay. okay. So, any, any questions? I have, I have a small question, yes. uh, uh, just for clar clarification. Um, so, this was uh, the summary slide for the first experiment. Do you mind going go, going back to that slide? Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay. So. Uh, so the first experiment was the diminutives. Yes. Um, all right, further back. Yeah, that was it. Okay. This, uh, the point in, in red, yeah. I, 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 I need clarification. Yeah. So, so can, uh, you, can you explain that point for me? Yeah, so um, the two forms are both available in the community, according to the speakers that I've worked with. So if you want to say little girls, you can either say penatutia, which is the, the broken plural uh, root plus the Greek morphology, or pindues, which is the sound, uh, uh, 
some plural uh, uh, root, right? It's singular, really. Uh, plus the the the, the blue, plural Greek morphology. Okay. Right. Right. So what's interesting here is that while both forms are available, uh, they're both included in the questionnaire, and there was a huge difference between uh, finding the correct translation, the correct form Pnatuthia for little girls, compared to Pindues. For some reason, there's there's something going on with the broken plural that makes it much harder uh, for them uh, to choose the correct form for them to. Mm -hmm. to know to, to learn some yeah I, I guess I was confused there because I I thought I understood from some of the previous slides that you couldn't mix yeah the, the Arabic singular and yeah the it was plural. yeah you, you understood right it was the only instance of uh of finding that yeah uh -huh. so you're referring to okay. right to these examples that's correct right so uh for for some of the speakers that would be the case and then for some others they would have both forms so it was actually part of the additional category that i mentioned the controversial forms mm -hmm. the ones that are debatable whether they exist or not um so i included that as uh, just for me to be sure that i'm testing everything that i can test and yeah. can, can just just to understand so what is what is this uh it's not on this slide, but this S plural, as opposed to this Thkia plural. Um, it's a it's a difference in gender. So the Thkia is uh, neuter, uh, whereas the S Hindu S is feminine. I see. So it's different. Uh, yeah. And why are we getting new to plural here? Because yeah, why are we getting new to plural? Uh, because the the diminutive, the separate the diminutive can either uh, select neuter or um, feminine in the other case, right? I so you, you have the option of doing both. I see. So that's just an independent uh, fact about how separate Greek grammar works. Okay. okay. Yeah. But uh, typically, yeah, this is uh, what I had found when I was uh, uh, working with with the speakers back in 2017-2018. Um, later on, um, more recently, I found that some speakers would accept both Natuthia and Pinduas. Mm -hmm. Some people would say Pinduas sounds strange. So I was like, okay, how about I include everything in the questionnaire and then I let them decide and tell me essentially, uh, you know, do you like this or not? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Other questions? We'll see. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, that was a very exciting talk, and there was so much stuff in there which I think is you know, I'm still processing. Um, but but one one question I wonder would, would the, the next step be to put the two variations together because it seems a little bit we looked at the structure variation mm -hmm. and and well, close diminutives. Mm -hmm. And that you can see there's variation, but then the social linguistics one, yeah, there's also different variations. But then yeah. the, one of the questions might be is there a correlation between so is it you know, yeah. can you see that that people have you no know, particular motivation of learning the language have you know are better at broken words? Um maybe that's a bit easy, but something along those lines. Yeah, perhaps. Um well the the smaller um the smaller uh uh aspect part of the of the project, the, the possessives and the diminutives. Are really small parts, small bits of the bigger picture, right? So what we're trying to see is what what kind of phenomena are vulnerable when acquiring a language as a heritage speaker. And here there's possibly two of them. But that means essentially that you still have to test an entire series of other phenomena in the grammar, syntax, semantics, and what have you, right? So we're not there yet. That's that's gonna happen in the next few years, hopefully. Um and uh yeah, with respect to connecting the sociolinguistics and and this, I can't give a clear answer to that now, I think, but uh, possibly, I don't know, possibly, right? When someone is so motivated to learn the language, perhaps, uh, um, yeah, perhaps we can link that somehow to the grammar and to the proficiency that they show at the end, right? When we do this, uh, this experiments. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know. I don't have the answer. It would be interesting because it might not actually be proficiency. It might, it might, it might, be, it might be more conscious almost. So I think a little bit of, of you know the old the box stuff with like Marcos Vigna, uh -huh. where people speak very differently. Yeah. Kind of mixed with vowels or something. Yeah. But then systematically, those want to stay on the island in one variety, those want to leave the island in yeah. another variety. Yeah. Exactly. So that's so my exactly. that 
you know, and it's interesting that a box office is phonology, but you have some kind of syntax so that the people, yeah. it would be really interesting that people use more broken plurals. If, and yeah. then the question is, what is the, yeah. the other, other variety? Yeah. But it would take you out of the out of the discussion of competence, something much more yeah. you know, manipulative. Maybe. Well, we, we also cannot give an answer to that now because the social linguistic study that I mentioned um, included all members of the community who are somehow related to, to the, to the uh, secret Maronite community, right? We don't have to be taking classes, so we don't have to be active learners. Mm -hmm. um, so we can't really kind of put them in the same basket and say, okay, you have to separate them. You have active learners for taking classes, and this is their proficiency, and this is the evidence for it. And then we have everyone else, right? Um, and that's that might also be harder to do because there's so few people who are actually learning SANA and taking classes. Mm -hmm. So I mentioned only two of them here, also on purple, right? There's not that many. Uh, I've met maybe five so far who are actually taking SANA classes. Uh, as you can imagine, given that, um, that there is no career prospects of learning the language as, a, as an LP speaker, maybe as a new speaker, um, there's not that, that much interest in the afternoon classes, but hopefully we're, we're going to, you know, with, with, the, with the research that's happening and with the revitalization efforts and with the talks that we're giving, we're going to make people interested in it and then start taking classes and then we can uh, try and answer that question. Yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. So I have a question about the, the process of you use. I think you, you started off by saying that in kind of immigrant communities, for example, you go back to them. Mm -hmm. um, but this isn't available in, in, in the case of minorities. And so you define the the older speakers of the language as kind of the, the correct speakers yes. as well. Yeah. And then you use that to measure the, the heritage of the younger generation. Yes. And then your conclusion was that that confirms that they're heritage speakers. But uh, I'm I'm just a bit confused but but um for example, kind of how, how do we know that the older speakers themselves have been kind of affected by a certain language um, so they, or, or that, you know, these yeah. the rules that you uncovered, for example, regarding plurals, maybe that's a kind of recent innovation. But, um, yeah, yeah. This is all done synchronically speaking. It's a synchronic analysis, right? That we, don't, we don't have access to how things used to be a couple of years, a couple of decades ago. Uh, so uh, essentially, with, with the methodology that I'm following here, um, I'm working with what I have, essentially, right? That's the that short answer. Um, the reason I chose the older speakers is because they're they're very fluent, right? Uh, one uh, reason for using narratives as well uh, in in the explanation uh, is to actually measure how fluent they are. So you can do all sorts of different metrics, MLU, uh, so counting different. Uh, how many words they produce, how many syllables, to have some sort of idea, how do you define fluency, right? Um, and, and so, you know, uh, yeah, the older speakers were the most fluent, uh, in, in my experience, uh, were the, so they were the most competent in that sense, uh, from the police work, I defined those as the most competent group, the baseline group, and then everyone else is compared to that, essentially, right? So, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be the case that we only have one group of heritage speakers, right? Perhaps there's intermediate groups that uh, that I haven't still, uh, defined or discovered here, but uh, this is only the beginning of you know, what I hope to be uh, future work, kind of differentiating between different groups, finding out which phenomena and grammar are actually acquired in what way and so on. Yeah. So just kind of additional questions out of curiosity. So in the question as you use, um, the Roman script for like, Latin script for, for the Arab. Uh, so yeah. why do they use that and not the Greek script? Just so curious. Because I also saw the teaching chart and the numbers in Latin script as well. Yeah. So essentially, this is kind of like a simplified uh, selling system that I use. You know, you can see some of the, uh, the sounds that are borrowed, like so, like just based on some of the IPA transcription kind of thing. So um, this is not what they're actually learning uh, necessarily, right? Um, with their localization record, uh, people came up with, uh, with an alphabet. Uh, since the Kubrick Maran and Arabic is spoken, it's very you know, people have to start learning how to write it as well. 
So, uh, uh, my colleagues, Spiros, uh, Dr. Marilena, Kaigalemu, they came up and their team, they came up with an alphabet to teach, which is not like this, right? I, I came up with this for the purpose of the research, right? Um, the speakers didn't seem to have problem with it. I was present when they were filling out the questionnaire. Uh, so they, they, didn't, they could easily read it, you know, it's readable, Kebanat, 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 um, but also related to what you ask, uh, if if this was uh, someone uh, knew more about uh, the context of cybersocial linguistics, they would also ask why they use the Greek alphabet since they're uh, bilingual speakers of Cypriot Greek. Cypriot Greek is also just spoken; it's not written. So again, it's the same kind of question: why did we decide to use that methodology? Speaking, and again, the motivation behind that is. Um, uh, because people are taught in standard modern Greek in school, uh, you may as well use that script uh, so as to avoid any points of debate and points of argument about, you know, you don't want them to lose focus or something. You don't want them to start discussing, oh, why did you write this in this way? Uh, you want them to be focused on the actual point of the question. Okay. Excuse me, we, we also have a question here in the chat. Um, so, with regards to diminutives, is there any kind of um, individual uh, variation in terms of uh, gender, social class, or education? That's a very good question. Um, I I didn't. I have uh, I have included those questions in the questionnaire. I didn't analyze it uh, here, so I, I can't answer that right now. Uh, but yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, th those points are included in the questionnaire, the first page where you ask the speakers, uh, you know, uh, you know, the gender, um, so questions are related to social class, uh, exposure to uh, to language, and and so on. Right. So, good point. Though. Thank you. I'll include that next slide. I think the camera is there, but I'm. Any more questions? questions? Okay. Well, I think in that case, it's uh, six o'clock. Uh, no, not six o'clock, five o'clock. Um, yeah. Uh, so let's um, wrap up there. But thank you so much, Natalia, for, for a really interesting talk. Um, yeah. And thank you all for coming. <laughs>